The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the third chapter of Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 22 is where we'll be on the Sunday we, we call Baptism of the Lord Sunday. Luke chapter 3, beginning with verse 15, reading through verse 22. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod the ruler, who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added, them all, added to them all by shutting up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, and Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, may we have ears to hear, to hear your words, whatever words I may put in the way. Words that call us farther along in the service of your kingdom deeper in relationship with you and with one another. Lord, help us to hear from you as we listen now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, Dylan, his older brother Doug, and their mom Rhonda would show up at our little church every so often on a Sunday morning for worship. They weren't regular attenders. They just pop in every so often. I first met Dylan and Doug when they came to our first Wednesday evening children and youth gathering. Our little church had never had anything like that, so we just started one Wednesday night about 5.30. Wasn't much. We just played football in the churchyard. It was Texas, after all. You play football every day of the year. And we'd have a simple little supper afterwards. We rotated it. Sometimes it was peanut butter and jelly and chips. Sometimes it was ham and cheese and chips. Sometimes it was hot dogs and chips. And then sometimes it was corn dogs and chips. And then if we had a fifth Wednesday night, it's pizza. Chips. But it wasn't much. We'd have supper and then we'd all come in the, the sanctuary and I'd give a little Bible lesson and We'd all pray and then go back out into the churchyard and play more football. It was always nice when we'd see one of those kids from Wednesday night come on Sunday morning, especially if they brought a parent. It was more of a rare occurrence, but it, it, it happened. To see them on Sunday, it was kind of odd. And to see Dylan and Doug and their mom, Rhonda, it was rare. But we were glad when we saw them on Sunday. And it really caught me by surprise one Sunday as I was standing on the little porch of our church and Rhonda and Dylan came to me and Rhonda said, Dylan wants to be baptized. I was excited. One, because you should always be excited when someone wants to be baptized, but I was excited because it was going to be my first. First time I'd ever get to baptize someone. After everyone had drove off, we spent a few minutes there in our little sanctuary that morning. I talked to Dylan. I said, Dylan, do you know what baptism is? Do you know what this means? Uh, Why do you want to do it? And we had to talk about the logistics of how, when, and where we would do it. Because you see, 
At Osage, we didn't have a baptistry like this one. No, at, ba- at Osage, there was a, a creek at the bottom of a little church road right next to the church. And so that week, I talked to, to their mom on the phone, and I drove out and met her at the church, and we walked down to see where we do the baptism. It had been a rainy season, so the creek was up high, and it ran over the road and cascaded down the other side just a bit. On the left side of the road, it looked like God himself had put it right there to be baptized. Nice big hole. Water was clear. You could see the fish swimming around. It looked like he had chiseled limestone steps down into the deepest part of the pool. All we were going to have to do was have somebody hold up the barbed wire while we went under. On the right side of the road, where the water ran over, it came down and fell into a little pool and carried on down the creek. Now the water there couldn't have been more than a foot, foot and a half deep. But guess which side Rhonda wanted to have the baptism on? The right side. So the Thursday before the Sunday, we'd have the baptism. I threw a shovel in the back of my little S10, drove out to Osage down to the bottom of that hill. And that Thursday, that Thursday afternoon, I dug a hole about three feet deep and big enough, I figured, to do a proper Baptist baptism. Because you know, you got to go all the way under. And so I made a nice little pool, and the water would come off and fall in. Made like a little waterfall, and it was nice, you know, for pictures. The day came, and I was a bit nervous. You see, we hadn't had that class yet. In seminary at Truett, we had a day where we all went to the Baylor pool, and we would baptize one another, young and old, big and small, man and woman. We'd all baptize each other. We hadn't had it yet. And since I had done it before, then I'd skipped it. Well, the day came, and I was a bit nervous. And so I got up that morning. I usually would wear like a golf shirt or just a plaid shirt, but I put on a white dress shirt and wore my swim trunks under my slacks. Swim trunks I have since christened my baptism shorts because they have nice red, white, and blue flames that come up the side. Some of you who have been baptized have seen those shorts. So we had worship that morning, and after the closing prayer, we left the sanctuary and headed down that road towards the creek. Most of us walked. A few folks drove down in a Suburban or two. I had my towel over my shoulders, praying the whole time that the Crocs my friend John had given me wouldn't slip on the gravel or the road or the wet rocks as I climbed down into the creek five or six feet from the road. Dylan was wearing clothes I'm sure his mama called play clothes as he climbed down and he stood in the creek, socks and shoes and all. We sang some stanza about baptism. I don't remember, but Audrey Schultz, our music director, she sang it more than the rest of us. I prayed. I said some words about baptism. Then I held my hand up in the air, and I said, Dylan, have you accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. I said, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it was a bit awkward getting Dylan down in that hole I dug But he went all the way down. And when he came up, all God's people said, Amen. And then we slogged it back up the dirt road, back up to the church, where I changed into some dry clothes and drove home thinking about how I had just done my very first baptism. My very first. And it was the very last time we ever saw Dylan or his mom. I baptized him, and they seemed to fall off the face of the earth. Now, unfortunately, that's not the last time that ever happened. And what may be sadder is every minister I've ever met can tell you the same story. I baptized them and never saw them again. They just disappeared. I remember being angry. At first, I was just angry at Dylan and his mom. Why would they just quit coming to church after getting baptized? Don't they know you're supposed to be more active now? Shouldn't they have been more regular? Don't just come when we got sandwiches and chips on Wednesday nights. Don't just show up every so often when you feel like it. You're supposed to be here more now. More. 
didn't they have anything better to do? What were they doing now? Didn't they know that getting baptized doesn't save anybody? I know I had said that from the pulpit. I know I had said it to Dylan and his mom. I was mad. I felt betrayed, used, like they were just sort of using the church uh, and me as some sort of uh, instrument for a signpost in Dylan's life. Some cultural expectation out in rural Texas, as if Dylan was going to have a job interview one day. Well, Mr. Uh, Dylan, uh, where were you baptized? Oh, I was baptized by Brother Thomas down in the creek behind Osage Baptist Church. I, I got baptized. I was mad. Then I remember being angry at myself. Had I done everything I could as a pastor to make sure these folks stayed at church? What exactly was I supposed to do? I was bivocational, going to seminary. I lived 30 miles away. What was I supposed to do? What could I do? Was it too late to do anything? I called, asked how things were going, told them I missed them, what was up. But after you hear the same thing over and over And when they stop answering the phone, what do you do? It kept me up at night, I'll be honest. It still keeps me up at night. Not Dylan, not his mom. It keeps me up at night when folks just fall off the face of the earth and never say a word as they go out the door. But then I remember being mad at the folks in our church. After Dylan and his mom were gone for a while, I remember asking some of our folks about them. I said, hey, have y'all seen them? And they'd say, who? On a good Sunday, we had 35 people in that little church. First baptism they had had in years. And folks would say, who? Oh, 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 the little dark-haired boy. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think I, think I remember them. No, I don't know what happened to them. Or they'd say, well, I could have told you that was going to happen. I knew that when they came down. I knew that was going to happen. Or they'd say, well, you know, that's what some folks do. I heard, I heard her mama was Catholic and just wanted Dylan to be baptized to appease her mama. That's what some folks do. I feel like they weren't even trying. As if they didn't see their role in making sure that people felt apart, felt included, felt like they were a part of our family of faith. If I'm real honest with you, it still bothers me a little bit when congregations think it's always the clergy's responsibility to make sure everybody stays, to make sure everybody feels apart. I'd wager a lot of folks slide out the back door of many sanctuaries unnoticed. Because church folks, well, well, you know, that's just what they do, they say. I was angry. This was supposed to be a big deal, my first baptism, and now it was all for nothing. didn't make any sense. I was angry at Dylan. I was angry at his mom. I was angry at myself. I was angry at the church. But the truth is, the truth is, I was probably more disappointed with the whole way we think about baptism that I was angry at anyone. You see, this Sunday on the liturgical calendar, we call it the Baptism of the Lord Sunday. It's always the first Sunday after Epiphany in which we reflect upon the baptism of Jesus and our own baptisms. And as I've been reflecting on that, on Christ's baptism, particularly from this passage in Luke, my own baptism nearly 17 years ago, and the many baptisms of which I've been a part over the last 13 years, something occurred to me. I think we've got it all backwards. And this backwards way of thinking about baptism just may be contributing to this phenomenon of folks who vanish before the waters dry from their hair. See, when I was baptized, I remember there was this whole semi-systematized thing I had to go through. A deacon in our church asked me if I had accepted Christ. Had I thought about being baptized when I said, yeah, okay, well, you've got to see our preacher. We had an interim pastor at the time. I remember sitting down with him, and he told me, okay, well, the first thing you got to do is, and he went through those ABCs. You remember those from Bible school? You got to admit you're a sinner, believe in Jesus, confess with your mouth, and then say the sinner's prayer, and you better really mean it. I remember he said that. You got to really mean it. I said, okay, I've done that. 
He said, well, the next thing you got to do is walk the aisle of the church. If I had thought about it, I'd asked him what chapter and verse it said that in. But he said, you got to walk the aisle at the church at the end during the invitation. You may not believe this, but I, I was terribly shy. Hated being in front of people. Still don't particularly like it, to be honest with you. And I told him, I said, can we get around that? Is there a way I don't have to do that? I told you, you can tell them, right? I mean, I sat way in the back with the youth. That's a long way. No, no, it's an unavoidable, necessary step. You got to do it. Then he said, after the church says amen, we'll sit down, we'll pick a date. You'll come to church, make sure you bring a change of clothes, and you'll be dunked in the water all the way. And then in his words, he said, and that's it. That's it. That's it. Now, granted, I know what he meant, but still, for a lot of folks, for a lot of us, if we're honest, that is it. Baptism is sort of an end, a goal, a divine destination that marks a sort of end to our personal spiritual pursuits. I mean, I've heard people actually say things like that, right? Well, I haven't seen so-and-so in years, but he was baptized here. As if they're an alumni of some university, right? And upon graduation, they never set foot on campus again. But they're still, they, they graduated from here. They were baptized here. We've taught ourselves to think of baptism as an end. I mean, how many times have you heard a preacher, I hope not me, but how many times have you heard a preacher before say something like, well, before you get baptized, before you walk that aisle, you better know that you know that you know. As if you've got to have it all figured out before you make a decision. Have it all figured out before you set a toe in the water. I can tell you, I've sat in conversations, especially with people who are talking to their children or to their, their friends about being, baptism, about being baptized. And the finality of it all, well, it even stressed me out so much that I started wondering if I need to re-up. Now, you better make sure you know. Make sure you know, because this is it. When you get baptized, make sure you know. Do you understand? As if we have to have some catechism about the Holy Trinity before we pour the waters. We see baptism as sort of the end of the line. But seeing baptism as an end is all wrong. It's backwards. It's inside out. It's upside down. I think it's why it seems like a lot of people's faith doesn't seem to mature past their baptism. Why so many are afraid of the hard questions that come with maturity, the struggle that comes with the passage of time and age. If we can just preserve the faith we had when we were baptized, when Sunday school answers were the best answers because they were the only answers, when the stories of the Bible didn't have the weight of reality and history but we're just nice stories about little boys fighting giants, uh, boats full of animals, and Jesus walking on the water. If we can just freeze our faith right there, then we can tether ourselves to it when it eases the confusion of life and the complexity that comes with it. But baptism isn't the goal of our faith. No one needs to, ought to, or ever really does have it all figured out before they put on the little white gown and step in the water. You see, baptism isn't the end goal. If anything, it's the beginning. The beginning of a journey. The beginning of life truly lived. The beginning of maturity, growth, and the beginning of the good news. I mean, think about it with me for a moment. Which gospel is it in which Jesus is crucified, dead, buried, resurrected, and then baptized? Is it in John, where he's on the shore cooking fish for the disciples? And he says to Peter, Peter, feed my sheep, and then I'm going to need you to come over here in the water and baptize me to make sure we know this is all wrapped up in a nice little bow. No. No. Or was it, was it in Matthew's gospel, right
right, right in that moment when he's giving the disciples the Great Commission, you know that passage, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. But before you do, make sure you baptize me so we'll all know this is the end. No. Is that what happens off screen in Mark's Gospel when the women flee from the tomb terrified? Jesus has found some little creek by the Mount of Olives and is baptized? No. Is that where Jesus is coming from when he meets the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, dripping wet after having been baptized to say this is finished? Of course not. All four Gospels begin the ministry of Jesus where? At the Jordan, with John, with baptism. It's the moment, especially in Luke's gospel, we hear that is pregnant with potential. The event filled with expectation. The instance in which life breaks open and our identity as a child of God becomes more and more real as we set out on a journey to live into that identity. It's the beginning. It's the beginning. But I wonder, are you stuck there? Are you still stuck there by the waters of your own baptism, believing it was the end? To hear you shall come and no further. Are you still there? Jesus says, get up, dry off, come and follow me. Jesus is calling you always on calling you to move, to grow, to live into the identity as the beloved of God. Or maybe, maybe you're waiting for your own baptism and you don't even realize it. You're just sort of in a holding pattern, dragging you. I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I'm there. I don't have it all figured out. I don't come to church as often as I like. I don't read. I don't have the Bible memorized. Like I don't have. I don't have it all together yet. I'm not ready to be there. And so you're just sort of dragging your feet because you believe baptism marks an end, a finality, an end to life outside of religion, an end to life uh, that you have now to whatever you're holding on to because you believe it's the best you got. Maybe you haven't come to the water yet because you think, I don't have it all in line. Friends, the good news is you don't have to. Quit that way of thinking. Jesus doesn't call you to the water to stay there. He calls you through it. Christ is calling you to jump in, to get wet, and then to get out and dry off and set out on this great journey of life, of faith, of love, to realize that baptism is not the end, but it is the beginning of a life lived in the fullness of God's presence, in the fullness of God's Spirit, in the wholeness that comes with following Christ in a life lived towards and for others. So Christ calls you, not to the waters and no further, but through the water, through the fire, through the Spirit, Christ calls you now into a full life of growth, depth, and love. So what are we waiting for? Let's go. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, the beloved Son of God, baptizer of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you call us even now, those of us who've been through the waters of baptism, you call us ever on to understand that it was our beginning in this journey and not our end. That we are to, that we are to follow you on through the growing pains of faith into this work of your kingdom. And to those of us, Lord, who are still standing at the water's edge, 
afraid for whatever reason, Lord, to jump in. Afraid to leave our old selves behind. Afraid that we don't have it all figured out yet. Lord, give us the strength to dive in. To be immersed in your love and in the work of this kingdom to which you call us. Move among us now, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.